welcome back to the channel. Today we are taking a look at the Capita Super DOA, one of the most expensive but also most hyped boards of the season. Let's take a look. The Capita Super DOA or Defenders of Awesome. The Cavita Super DOA, or Defenders of Awesome, is the supercharged version of the much-loved classic DOA that's won millions or hundreds of awards over the past decade. And if you love that board and are sorry to see it go, don't worry, it's still in the lineup for 2025. But if you want a bit more tech and some extra weight savings, then this is the version the Cavita want you to buy. But should you take the bait, should you spend the extra $200, well, I'm gonna help you decide today, and I managed to get hold of the 2025 Super DOA for us to take a look at. Before we hop on over to the review, let's talk a little bit about the specs. In terms of the shape, just like the DOA, this is of course a true twin, meaning it rides exactly the same forwards as it does backwards, and it's an all-mountain freestyle deck that's gonna be good for riding pretty much anywhere, with a bit more focus on spins, jumps, park, etc. When it comes to flex, Capita put this board at a 6 out of 10 and the traditional DOA at a 5.5 out of 10. Now in practice, are you going to feel the difference of a 0.5 out of 10 score? Probably not, but if you want a slightly stiffer board, then this one would be the one to go for. When it comes to the sizing, the Super DOA is available in a 152, a 154, a 155 wide, a 156, a 158, a 158 wide, a 160, a 161 wide, and a 163 wide. So as you can see, they've got sizes for nearly everybody. Quick tip, this board does not have the most generous waist widths, so make sure you check the specs carefully to avoid getting the dreaded toe or heel drag. When it comes to the profile, Capita have used the same profile they've used in the DOA for ages, and that's the Resort V1 camber profile. And that uses a little bit of everything, so you've got positive camber between the feet, you've got zero or flat camber out near the binding inserts, a little bit of rocker towards the tip and the tail, and then their wow, pow flat kick technology, which helps engage the tip and the tail when you're popping ollies, but also makes it smoother for turns, and capital say makes it easier to plane in powder. In terms of the tech, it's obviously packed full of high-tech features, but to name just a few, number one is the 3D Thermopolymer Super Core, which is a long way of saying that they've trimmed down the core, made this awesome 3D design, and they've kept it as lightweight as possible whilst retaining the strength and the pop. They've also added their Fortress Aramid bound sidewalls, which basically means they're bulletproof, don't quote me on that. They've upgraded the base with the Hyperdrive Advanced XT base, which is essentially their fastest and highest tech sintered base. And they've again taken this even further with their Moonshot Omnitune, where they've stone ground a structure into the base, making it even faster and really smooth. Don't know why I did that, sorry. But that's probably enough of the tech talk. Let's jump on over and get on with the review. Before we get started, I have a small admission to make. This review is not exactly impartial. And the reason being is that for the first two or three seasons I spent on a snowboard, it was on the original DOA. So I've got very fond memories Memories? Memories of that board. So I'm going to find it hard to be entirely objective, but I'll do my best. So I tested the 2025 Super DOA in a range of conditions from groomers to park to tracked out afternoon powder. And I tried a range of bindings from the Burton Cartel, Rome Katana, and then later the Nidecker Supermatic, which I've reviewed in this video somewhere here. In all of these, I rode with my DC Judge boots, which are my boots of choice, and I'll link them in the description too. One of the areas that the classic DOA always did so well was how easy the pop was to initiate. And this board's no different. It's got the same shape, the same profile. It's got the extra carbon stringers and that extra bit of response. So it's super easy to initiate pop. And when you do activate it, it really pops nice and high. It isn't the most poppy board out of all the boards I've tested, but what sets it apart is how easy it is to pop. You really don't have to think about it. You can pop it off side hits, pop it on the groomers. It's just poppy, poppy. I also find that these nice flat sections under the nose and the tail made for a great section for buttering and for pressing. And because they've added these edge detunes, it's really nice for spinning around with butters. It does take a little bit more effort than you're gonna find with something like the Battalion Disaster, 
but it's worth it because you've got that extra pop and that extra response that you're not gonna get from a noodly, buttery board. When it comes to carving, this thing is no slouch. Now, it isn't a carving board, it's an all mountain freestyle board. It can carve really nicely, and the carbon and the extra response definitely make it a little bit nicer to carve than the traditional DOA, but it isn't gonna match something that's designed for carving that's directional and that maybe has some edge hold tech as well. That being said, one thing that always impresses me about the DOA is how much effective edge they can pack into the smaller board sizes. So because they've got these blunted tips and tail, actually in the 156, I've got a longer effective edge than I do in my Salomon Assassin in the 160. And that just means you've got the extra bit of edge to hold in those calves. In terms of speed, the base is lightning fast. You may not be able to see, but even after a few rides, it has retained this stone ground base. The sintered base is really nice and smooth. At high, high speeds, I did get a tiny bit of chatter in the nose and tail, which I imagine is going to happen when you've thinned it out to this degree. And anything with carbon stringers sometimes vibrates a little bit more than a board without, but this wasn't a big deal. You're not gonna notice it a huge amount. And because it's got relatively short nose and tail, you're not gonna have a big flappy nose like you do on a highly directional board. One benefit I haven't mentioned yet is that all of Capita's boards are made in the mothership. And this is a manufacturing facility in Austria that focuses on eco-friendly building practices and only snowboards are made there. Unlike some of these factories in China that are making whatever you could think of. This means that they've got a real good grips on their quality control and their boards really show really good craftsmanship. That being said, one thing I did worry about is how much they've managed to thin out the nose and tail and whether this puts them at risk of snapping if you land super nose or super tail heavy. Now I did do that when I was testing. I hit a couple of reasonable size cliff drops, landed a bit tail heavy and nothing happened other than it was nice and supportive and that extra bit of carbon helps to snap you back out. However, in theory, it's definitely something to watch and I look forward to seeing how it does over the next season. The only other downside, which you were all expecting me to say, is that this board wasn't the best in powder. Now, is that a criticism? Not necessarily. It's an all mountain freestyle board. It isn't designed to be the best in powder. It was actually really fun for spinning off of little jumps and booters into powder, more so than these super directional decks. But if you've got two feet, three feet of fresh, you're gonna wanna swap out to something like the Telos Backslash or something more powder specific that couldn't even come close to competing with this in terms of all mountain ability. But when it comes to powder, you do need a specialist powder board. So in summary, as you probably guessed, I was a big fan of this board. I was probably always gonna be, but that doesn't detract from the fact it's super fun, super poppy, it makes the whole mountain into a park, and that's exactly the type of board that I like. Who shouldn't get this board? Well, if you're a complete beginner, definitely don't go for this. Go for something cheaper, something more straightforward, and then you can graduate to this board when you're ready, and if you stick with snowboarding, which you should. If you're an intermediate level rider, the argument could be made to go for the classic DOA. It's slightly softer, you're putting less money into the board so you're gonna be less worried about it. And that's really not a bad decision if you wanna go that way. If you're an intermediate rider and you're really dying to get this board, you're gonna be really stoked to ride it, you don't mind spending the extra money, then just go for it, honestly. Extra stoke means extra riding ability. Everyone knows that. But I'm interested to hear what you think. Have I made a glaring error? Have I let the hype go to my head? Let me know in the comments section below. Hopefully you found this review helpful. If you did, then make sure you hit that subscribe button so that we can see you in the next one. And if you feel like picking up the board and supporting the channel, then I'll put the links in the description below. See you in the next one.